Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Off Script with Pastor Jared and Emily Russell. Amelia Bedelia in the studio, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <laughs> glad to have her. Uh, today we have a topic that is, um, I would say, near and dear to your heart. Is that fair? Yes. Yes. So we're going to talk about church music, congregational worship, um, and obviously that's something I care deeply about. Uh, I've been, I have been a worship leader at times in my life and uh, have probably, I, I think since 2017, 2018, no, scratch that, since I was age 17 or age 18, which is much earlier than 2017, <laughs> um, have been picking uh, five or so songs a week until I came to Kirby Woods. So that's about, I don't know, 10, 12 years of picking lots of songs. Um, I've seen a lot of changes in the worship scene since the uh, late 2000s to now the early 2020s. And so, um, yeah, being a worship leader is, is hard in the, in the changing scene. So um, this is a, just so you guys know, this is a topic that Emily cares a lot about and brought to me one day when we were talking about podcast topics that That's would true. be interesting. And uh, I put it on my list and thought one day we're going to get to it. And today's the day. Congratulations. I thought you filed away in the trash can and thought we would never talk about this. File 13. I thought you saw yep. my thoughts and you're like, yeah, I'm just going <laughs> to silently push this away and we're not actually going to talk yeah, about the this. Old, uh, the old, we'll table that, and uh, which really means... I'll, pr- I'll pray about it. Never I'll pray again. about it. Yeah, never again. So, uh, no, it is today. So, congregational music, church music, church worship. Um, I think we say worship sometimes and we mean music. So, just so you know, for the conversation, ladies and gentlemen at home, um, we're really talking about music. Obviously, prayer is worship, giving is worship, preaching is worship, all that. But we're talking about music today. So um, what's what's your background, Emily, in, in uh, church music? I know folks at Kirby know you sing a mm-hmm. lot at our church. But yeah. beyond that, what's kind of your background in, in church music? Um, so, well, I've been in church my whole life. So I have a lot of experience with church music just from that, being a congregation and a church member. Um, I haven't been singing in church like with like the worship team and stuff until probably right after I graduated college. I've always liked to sing, but I was always really scared to. But only just recently until after college is when I started actually Hmm. doing that. So you were fairly late in the game then on on actually singing in public. Yes. Do you remember the very first time you sang in public? And tell us about it. Um, I remember it's not a church setting, but when I was in high school, a I talent show? It, was, I it was, knew it. <laughs> it was just for, it was just a vocal thing. It was a thing that my high school did kind of like an American idol type thing where you sing. And it was one of those things like, I just want to push myself to do it. I'm terrified, but I want to do it. And my, like the night before I was crying. This is my, this was like my senior year of high school. I was a okay. senior. So, so I was, not old. A middle schooler. no, I was like a senior. And the night before I was like crying cause I was just so nervous and upset. How I and sing since you've been gone by <laughs> Kelly Clarkson in front of all those people. <laughs> but my mom was like, you don't have to do it. But then she was like, look, I've been in situations like this before, though, where I've been terrified. And then I backed out and I regretted it. So, like, mm-hmm. just just do it. That's good. It was great advice. And I did it. And I did well. I didn't make it to the next round. But I was like, I did it. And I was proud of myself. So that was, like, one of my first. Well, that was one of my first, like, just me, like, going out there doing it. I did do some stuff as kids, like, in kids programs and stuff. But that's a yeah. different ball game, being, like, as a kids program yeah. choir thing. Nick Bushart singing the characters <laughs> Neil Downs, that kind of thing. Yes. Uh, not quite the same. Do you remember the song? What was, I know you, I, know I you do. sang, it was a need to breathe and it was, um, lay him down by need to breathe. Oh, go down to the river. Yeah. Okay. It's yeah. a great song. It is a good song. It was fun. Um, just for the record, I too, my first, uh, time ever singing, uh, publicly was at a church talent show. Mm-hmm. And it was, uh, I sang Three Wooden Crosses by Randy Travis. Wow. And uh, yeah, everything everything changed after that. There you go. Fame and fortune followed me. That's uh, right. quickly. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so a little more. T- well, tell us about um, like how music took you through college, because clearly that's when it kicked in. If you mm-hmm. really weren't, if you were crying into your pillow senior year, <laughs> uh, probably there was a big change in college. Yeah, I, um, so I was always a band kid growing up, so that was my thing. So I played the flute starting in sixth grade mm-hmm. all the way up until all through college. That was my, I was a flautist. Yep. Um, that sounded a little too pretentious, so I always just said flute player, <laughs> being from Mississippi, saying a flautist sounded too fancy, yeah, so flute does. player. Um, but I ended up double majoring in music and psychology at Union, 
And so my main instrument was flute. So I was a band kind of, I didn't do choir, vocal, anything like that. I was a band kid. So I did, yeah, double majored in music and psychology in college with the intent of, because when I was in college, I discovered a degree and a program called music therapy. And I was interested in going into music therapy. Um, and I auditioned at the University of Louisville. I was accepted at their program, but that was really expensive. So I decided not to take any more student loans to go do that. Um, and that was really neat learning about music and just like the power of music as it affects us. Cause music therapy is not like just singing some songs when you're sad. Right. It's not that. Um, the equivalent it's, of the golden retriever. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. That's what most people think when they think, Oh, music therapy. But I was looking at, um, different like ways music th- therapy is used in like medical areas. And so like music is used in like the NICU to help regulate babies' heartbeats and breathing Mm -hmm. and things like that. Or it's used in um, people who are stroke victims and they can't really speak, but because of the way music works in your brain, they can still sing. Mm. And so it like helps with rewiring connections in your brain between the left and right side of your brain. And so that was really fascinating, like learning at music and like the effects like on our bodies and our minds. And then I had a professor at Union, Dr. Matthews, who's an incredible music professor, and he gave a chapel service one time and talking about the state of church music. And it was incredibly eye-opening because I feel like I'd always kind of had, not always, but I had some kind of levels of discontent with different church music I saw, but I couldn't give voice to it. And then when he gave that chapel talk um, that one day, it was like in 2015, I remember the year, it like was mind-blowing and like changed everything. I was like, this, mm-hmm. this is what I've been feeling this whole time. This is so good. Yeah. So um, when did you start getting into, like, vocal music in, in, in church and kind of stepped into that? And I know you also did some recording with a group on, on campus at Union as well. So tell about that, too. Yeah. Um, I think the first time I started really singing in church, um, the church I went to right before coming to Kirby, New Prospect um, Baptist Church in Olive Branch. I, so after I graduated from college, I moved back um, home and I went to church there for about a year before I moved up to Memphis and then started going to Kirby. So I was on the worship team there. My uncle plays drums at that church. And so, and I had a friend that I, or acquaintance that sang on the team. And so I joined them. So that was the first time, like, really being involved with the worship team. And then coming to Kirby, I didn't sing at all until maybe early 2020 might have been when I started Mm -hmm. singing here at Kirby. Yeah. Well, yeah. So um, once coming here, I know you started getting involved in some of the song selection Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, a little bit of the worship planning element. Uh, Mm -hmm. I know we had a team approach um, originally. Mm -hmm. So um, let's talk about congregational worship and some of the things that you have that you wanted to talk about today. So when you think about congregational worship, what it is, uh, the purpose of it, uh, how how would you explain that to people, especially those that are kind of like, there's most most people just show up to church and sing. Like mm-hmm. they don't really think about why they're doing it. Mm-hmm. I, and I, I think that's where most people are is, is uh, you might even ask people, hey, why do we spend, um, you know, upwards of 30 to 40 percent of our Sunday worship service in music? Like who decided that? What is where did that come from? You know, what what's the point of that? Uh, you, you might have some people some gluttons for punishment that would like, I would just want the whole thing to be preaching or, you know, and, or do away with the music. Or, and some people might want more music, but what's the, what's the purpose of why you would even have musical worship in church? Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of ways to answer that. I think one, well, we see it clearly in scripture, the use of music as a part of worship. So we see it used in the temple, like with King David, he really implements Uh, musicians, and we see the psalms that a lot of them were clearly meant to be uh, sung. And then we also see in the New Testament to the hymns and spiritual songs, that verse, which is in Colossians? Yeah, I think it's in uh, Colossians. 3.16-ish. Yeah, so it's clearly a model in Scripture, so that's first and foremost. But music, I see, is a God-created thing and a gift that God gives us um, to learn, to internalize truths, and things like that. So I think a big misconception that people get when they come to church is they think this is just my personal time 
me and the Lord. This is my personal time. This is just me and God right now. And that does happen. But primarily, you can do that and should be doing that throughout the week on your own. But Sunday is a unique thing where it's a congregational worship. You're all together singing. And that's a much more unique space. And there's different goals and purposes in that congregational space than just you by yourself. Yeah, it, most people forget those uh, three words that come before psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. It says addressing one another mm-hmm. in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So, yeah, the the congregational music experience is really not a private moment. It's mm-hmm. not a concert. It's uh, it's meant to be sung from person to your left to your right. So, yeah. and that's even an, that's an argument that people should be able to hear one another from time to time. Yeah, for sure. That's another thing is that sometimes churches crank the volume so loud. Yeah, you can't hear that anybody. That it's, you cannot even hear, um, even if you, you know, have those moments where the band cuts away, it still can be hard sometimes. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I think there have to, and, and good worship teams know how to do this, to to plan those moments where you're, aware you become aware for a brief moment that you're in a room full of people yeah that you were all singing the same things and uh also with lighting like there's sometimes when it shouldn't be completely like concert dark yeah. because you then you can't see yeah. other people so there should be uh, some ability to have awareness that you're in a room with other christians singing to god and that there's almost like a, a conversation left yeah. and right as well as up and down it has yeah. to be both yeah. Has to be both. Yeah, there's been like so many times where like I've come to church and I'm just like I don't know, maybe going through something or I'm angry or I'm frustrated or you're sad and maybe you personally don't feel like singing, like you're singing these words like praising the Lord, and maybe you're just actually not feeling it. But because everyone else around you is singing these truths, it's a good encouragement to you. Like mm-hmm. I maybe I don't feel it right now in this moment, but I can still affirm and agree like what we're singing and doing is true and good, and it's a good encouragement to your own soul to be able to hear everyone else affirming what you believe. Yeah, and to see other people in the act of worship is, is good for you, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember I went to a concert, uh, a conference, not a concert, <laughs> a conference one time, and um, there was uh, there was a broad range of ages there, and there were some senior adults and some young people, and, and uh, they, were, they were doing a lot of songs that were really modern, and you know, I, I happened to watch a senior adult lady that was sort of like up and to my left a little bit in front of me. I could see her. She was trying to learn some of the new songs and sing along with some of the modern stuff. She made a real effort, although you could tell she did not know these songs. Mm-hmm. And then they did this little thing. The band did this thing where they threw to a hymn in the middle of the modern songs. And 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 she, I kid you not, like she threw her hands up and she started singing. I cry, I man cried a little bit. <laughs> uh, and it was just, but it was because I watched i saw that unfolding that i was like that's really awesome and it did something in in my heart to see her worship man so i thought this that's what needs to be happening mm-hmm. we need to we need to see each other um experiencing uh worship with yeah. the lord yeah i would say like one of the main purposes of like the corporate congregational singing you know we call it worship time is to unify and to strengthen the body which is why and I think because that's its purpose, we see it undermined so often. Like it yeah. causes the most division that we see in the church. Because right. its purpose is to unify, but the way Satan gets us, it just completely disrupts and yeah. everything. And that's a great point because that's what he does. Is he with anything? You know, you can, uh, you know, money, power, sex. Like you go down the list. Anything that could be good on its own, mm-hmm. Satan takes it, twists it, perverts yeah. it, and then makes it actually a bad thing. Yeah. So yeah, worship. It, it's kind of like. It would be like fighting over communion or something. Like it's supposed yeah. to be something in your church that is actually a very unifying moment yeah. where we all come together. And uh, but it has become. I mean, would you say maybe the most divisive issue of the last twenty years? Yeah, one of the most. I can't think of another one that's worse. In- Churches split over it all the time, or to compromise, they'll do the different services. You know, nine a.m. is the traditional, and eleven is the yeah. contemporary, just to try just to keep can't. the peace. Cause, yeah, because it's like we we are going to fight over this, so yeah. let's just split them but up. But it should be unifying. It should be, yeah. But it it has become the exact opposite of that because I think, um, we're driving when you drive with your preferences that hard. I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's hard to compromise when you're that passionate about something that's not really necessary to be passionate about. Yeah. So 
anyway, yeah, I I think um, in a church service, that's um, when I think of like the purpose of worship. You said this, and I'll expand on it a little bit. Is um, the rehearsal of your theology? Mm-hmm. When I when I step back and think about the essence of what worship is, um, I think there's like two two parts to it that are true. There's there's the heart side and there's the head side. And the, mm-hmm. the heart side is that I really am trying to connect with God in this moment. Mm-hmm. And people may perceive that as emotions. Um, I, I Again, you, you don't need to be anti-emotions. Like it, it, there, there are times when you really need that sense of connection with God, and that can come through music. You have to be careful. Music is an emotional tool. Mm-hmm. It, like you said, you know, there, there are some... Physi- physical things that happen in your body when music's played. Mm-hmm. So you have to steward that as a worship leader and not manipulate people because you can. And we've seen that done yeah, in bands. Very easily. You know, the tribal bridge that builds, you yeah. know, for 10 minutes straight and it's like repeat, 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 repeat. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I'm hypnotized and it's like, right. I'll do whatever. Uh, so yeah, you can, you can go nuts with that. But again, that's the Satan thing. Let's pervert a good thing. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean the thing isn't good mm-hmm. to begin with. So, you know, it's a... A, a real connection can be made with God through mm-hmm. music, and and there have they have always had music in the Bible. Like to go back when they crossed the Red Sea, yeah. they sang a big song, right. I mean, the Song of Moses. You know, and Miriam is out there leading with the tambourines, right? And uh, I mean, God's people have really always been a musical people. Yeah. So so that's one side. There's that connection, that kind of um, heart emotion connection with your creator, which is a good thing. And then there's that kind of mind connection where you are rehearsing your theology over and over again, where um, you're, you're trying to come to terms with what, what truth is mm-hmm. and then singing it and saying it. And I think you could say, you probably had heard this in a class somewhere, but when you sing a truth, it hits differently in your brain. It lodges yeah. differently than a preacher. So yeah. like, I do both, and I and I have to come to terms with the fact that people will remember mm-hmm. what the what the music lyrics say way more yeah. than they'll remember what I preach. Yeah, so absolutely it hurts my feelings. <laughs> yeah, sad but true. <laughs> but like, if I if I said, you know, Emily, tell me, you know, what I said in my second point on Sunday, you probably couldn't even get close, right? Like mm-hmm. maybe pull. The, the one point. Yeah, I could get like an idea, but I couldn't get like the word for word but of like if I, what you said. But if I started you like on the second song we sang Sunday, mm-hmm. I bet you could at least give me like Most verse, chorus, bridge or something mm-hmm. like that. You could give, especially if it's a hymn that's been done yeah. over and over yeah. again. I mean, you yeah. can start with, I mean, how great thou art and I could give you the whole song yeah. right now. That's That's another like with the music therapy part that I studied. And I mean, when you see videos of it all the time, like someone who has Alzheimer's, like they can't, sometimes they can't even remember their own children's names, but you'll play a song for them from like their teenage years and they will know every single word. Mm -hmm. So just like the power music has for us to like internalize it and remember it. So we have to be careful about the words that we're singing. Yeah. Well, let go to that as kind of the next point. When you're, when you're tasked with, and this might be at any level, like this doesn't have to be on Sunday morning for the main service. I know you guys pick songs in the in Wednesday uh, youth worship. Mm-hmm. I know there's there's multi levels at any church where songs are getting picked to be sung or, or, or taught. Or So what kind of filters should you have in your head when you're when you're choosing songs? Like what are good what are good congregational songs? And I say congregational because. Mm-hmm. There can be great songs yeah. that are great in the car, you yeah. know, but they may not be a good fit to sing with the church body. So how, yeah. how do you go through uh, that filter process? Yeah, I think there's really just two main questions, so it's pretty simple. The first one is most important is, are the words true to Scripture? Are we singing what is true about God, what's true about His character, what's true about the gospel? All those things. Do the lyrics line up with scripture and what's true there with our theology. And then the second one is more practical. Is this accessible to a congregation? Is it a right key? Does it go too high? This is not a time to show off your vocal range. (laughs) This is not an audition. (laughs) This is not the talent show or the American (laughs) Idol audition. Like, could 
Could your average person who has no musical background, you know, sitting in the back row, could they sing and engage with mm -hmm. this song? So is it good keys? Is it good tempos? Is the rhythm of the melody, you know, can you catch on with it? Is it how complicated is it? Are you having these really long, awkward breaks in between the verses and the bridges where everyone's just kind of sitting there with their hands in their yeah. pockets and don't know what to do? Yeah. Like, just practically, is it engaging and accessible to average congregation members who have no musical training or background. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's interesting you started with lyrics because I think most people, when they think of music, they do not think of lyrics first. Uh, and I would argue, <laughs> I would argue that like dissecting the worship wars of the last 20 years in churches, it has not been a fight about lyrics. Mm -mm. It's mostly been a fight about style yeah. or, or about, um, you know, whether it was, I don't know how to even describe it, you know, very upbeat, pumping Hillsong style music, or yeah. or more reverential, slower um, hymn style music. Yeah. So I, but I think when you you can back away from any song, and if you just look at the lyrics, I think it, that has to stand on its own, like yeah. almost like a poem. Yeah. Because let let's be honest, there are some songs in the in the modern movement that sound contemporary that have great lyrics. Mm -hmm. So like it is it is not true that all the good songs were written a long time ago. Right. And and there are some hymns that have some bad lyrics that yeah. are not very good. Right. Um and that may be an episode to like name drop one of these <laughs> days some of them. Um but like you also have to remember, I'll just put this out there for people to ponder, a hymnal when you hold a hymnal in your hand, you're holding the greatest hits from three to 400 years, the greatest hits. There are thousands of hymns that didn't make it in there yeah. that got written. Like, you think you have every hymn Fanny Crosby ever wrote? No, no. She wrote thousands of hymns, and yeah. you only have, like, the five that were really, really good. Yeah, the tried and true ones. Yeah, it would be like in, in 200 years if someone was like, how many songs did Chris Tomlin write? Only five are in the hymnal. You're like, yeah, that guy wrote, like, a thousand so songs, like how many albums and how many features did he do? It, it's like that. I mean, yeah. so when you have a hymnal, what you really have are the greatest hits. So it's not really fair to compare a hymnal to the the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. It's just not a fair fight. Yeah. Hymnals represent the best of three decades or three centuries. Sorry, it's three yeah. centuries. <laughs> and um, so to compare like that between what happened between 2000 and 2020, you're going to lose. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't beat three centuries of great stuff. Yeah. Now, there, it still is true, though. You, from any style, you should be able to pull back and look at the lyrics that you have. Is mm -hmm. this teaching biblical truth? Um, and, and yeah, like you said, does it, does it rise and fall in a way that's... Because, like, to get practical, like, sometimes... Sometimes people try to write music and they come out and try to make it the most theologically dense mm -hmm. document. Like, let's just sing the Westminster yeah, Catechism. Yeah, it'd be extremely and, wordy. And it's like that, that but, but it's not good. You yeah. know, it, on some level, they, and there's a lot of bands that they don't have that many hits because they just can't get past, you don't have to squeeze in, um, you know, a systematic theology mm -hmm. into your, into every single line and use extremely dense the wording, right? Um, there is a skill and an art to songwriting, mm -hmm. and that's why, like these Hillsong folks, you may not like them, but they they do know how to write good music that that rises and falls and, and right. things like that. So, um, but yeah, the lyrics are are primary, and I think I think if you started there, you could avoid a lot of fights. Oh yeah, in your churches. Yeah, because with just these like two qualifiers. You're not limited to any style no, or you didn't, you year didn't say or decade. No, you didn't say anything are, about style, and, you, and it should lead to a good mix of hymns, traditional, you know, '90s contemporary traditional that we're used to. You know, modern day hymns that are being written. You know, some modern contemporary worship, like that, it opens you up to any type as long as it's true to scripture and it's able for your congregation to be able to sing it. Then you would naturally have a mix because you're not limiting yourself to any one type right. of genre or year or decade. Yeah. I want the best available yeah. in any which, time. Which then 
helps accomplish the part of unifying the body because you are singing the best of every yeah. generation. And what an incredibly unifying experience that is for to have older songs, being able to teach the younger generation, but also having, you know, being encouraged that the younger generations are writing new music and right. being able to pass those down. Right. Yeah. You don't, you don't want to communicate to your young folks that this is a closed canon, you know, yeah. like it's not, it's, there are, there are great new songs. We should be looking for good new songs all the time. Like keep up with a few of your favorite artists that are putting out good things and, and there's going to be good music that comes out. But it's also really cool to know we can sing like I think "Be Thou My Vision" is like one of the oldest yeah, hymns, it's really old. or like "Holy, Holy, Holy." Parts of that come from like the Council at Nicaea, I mm -hmm. think. It, it, so, like that's really, it. really old. And uh, well, and if you sing to really, if you sing Psalms, you're, right. you're going all the way back. Yeah. So you're you're back in David's day. So, um, you know that that's really cool to think about that you're joining into a long heritage yeah. uh, of music when you jump into that. Yeah, I think that's it. It connects you to something bigger than just yourself. And what do I like? You know, this year it connects you to a bigger thing of a yeah. long lineage of believers who have come before you, but then that are also continuing on mm -hmm. later. If you're just plugged into the contemporary music movement, um, that really limits you from the '70s to today. Yeah, and that's the movement you've plugged into. But if you're committed to more of a timeless approach of I will sing good music that honors God from any time, now you're into the long history of the church. Mm -hmm. I mean, you get, to, you get to claim Moses as your songwriter right. or David or, or any of those guys. So, so yeah, that's cool. Um, and I think the other point that you make about accessibility is really important mm -hmm. because, um, you know, there, there are, you, can, you can do certain things to make your church sing with you or not sing with you. Mm -hmm. like, and we've, all, we've had both. I'm sure you've had both experiences. There's days when the the music quality might have been great that day mm -hmm. but for what, but they just weren't singing with you yeah and then they weren't leading you to join in with them yeah, they were yeah. going off on their own and, and they it, they were great but I, I couldn't say, keep up i would say like that's kind of a fail right like yeah. if you had if you were if you're leading worship that day and you nail it music wise mm -hmm. and you hit all the you hit all the points and benchmarks that you wanted to hit with your band that day but the crowd didn't sing with you. The, mm -hmm. the church wasn't with you. They weren't um, engaged in what yeah. you're doing. I would say that was a that was a fail, you know, because that's the point. Yeah. The point is so. But on the other side, if you had a day where maybe you hit a few, you had a few voice cracks, you had a few uh, bad notes on mm -hmm. the instruments that, and uh, maybe the band missed their intro or something. Mm -hmm. But people were singing back at you right. really loud and they were engaged and you could tell they're, they're connecting with God. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a better day. Yeah. That's a good day. Yeah. Because that's the standard. I mean, I, I really think most churches don't know how to answer the question. What constitutes a good day yeah. of worship? Um, if, if you're, if your answer is that the band nailed it, well, that's that's not really the biblical answer. Yeah, uh, that wasn't the point to begin with. <laughs> no, no. I mean, you can that, that has nothing to do with anything. But so that's why you have to start with saying, "What's our goal here? What are we What are we trying to do? Mm -hmm. We want to honor God above all other things, but we also want our our people to sing with us. Yeah, we want our church to be engaged and sing. So if you're not accomplishing that, you really are missing it. You miss the whole point. And um, you learn as a worship leader that there are things you can do that can encourage singing and can discourage singing. Mm -hmm. um, like I, just to kind of name a few things, we'll go to close after this, is like if you turn up the volume too loud, if you have really weird, awkward extended breaks, if you um, never address the crowd, like you never speak to them, mm -hmm. then uh, they're, you know, the lights are off. They're, if you you can do certain things and they just won't sing because yeah. they're not engaged. They yeah. don't, uh, or you sing, you sing songs that are impossible yeah. to sing. You know? Yeah. Are there um, even sometimes like when we're doing a song on Sunday that maybe in the recording, you know, by the third verse, the, the lady, you know, she'll change it up a little bit, the ad -lib. but she, yeah, she'll change the melody. And I try not to do that because 
you know, we've sung the melody consistently for the first two verses, but if all of a sudden I change it in the third verse, then everyone out there is like, well, that's not what we just yeah. sang a minute ago. I just gotten comfortable with it. Now it's different because yeah. I'm trying to keep the same melody that we did because then if I change, then they're like, oh no, what, what mm-hmm. do I do? <laughs> right. But like that works in the car because the whole point is to um, like build the song, to keep the song interesting because they're, right. assuming, they're assuming you're just listening. Yeah. But for church... You, you want people to sing through the whole thing. They're not just listening. Mm-hmm. You want them to sing with you. So that kind of goes back to my, um, <clears throat> my thought on there's different applications for good, for good music, too. Mm-hmm. Like, this is really important. I don't think people think about this very often. That um, I think the highest filter for, for music is in corporate church gatherings. Mm-hmm. Like, that should be... Um, the most scrutinized, the best songs with yeah. with good lyrics, the, with music that is singable, that encourages congregational yeah. singing. Yeah, these are songs that parents ideally would like sing with their children to help teach them, or songs that like you'll sing it. You're at someone's funeral to right. help get you through grief and right. things like that. So what we sing at church are songs that we're gifting people through all sorts of seasons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for the record. Uh, y'all might not know this. I've done a, I've done several uh, funerals in my day. I've done a good bit of funeral music. I wonder if people would be interested to know what songs people ask for at their funeral. Would you be interested? I would be interested Do you have in any that. guesses? Mm, how great that art. Yes, mm-hmm. that is absolutely one of the top three. I can't think of any others. I would say I would say Amazing Grace. Oh yeah, for sure. And How Great Thou Art are are battling for number two and three. Yeah, number one. It is well with my soul. Oh, yeah. And, and it's not even close. Such like, a good one. I've done many funerals. It, it is a rare day that yeah. I don't get asked to do one of those yeah. three songs at a funeral. Yeah. And that, but that tells you that, that those songs are timeless. Like, yeah. they're not going anywhere. Yeah. And people connect with them, and they're beautiful. The lyrics are beautiful. The melody's beautiful. It's singable. Yeah. Like, perfect. Yeah. Perfect songs yeah. for church, uh, for modern... Uh, for corporate worship yeah. applications. And the topic, I mean, that's a whole other thing you get on, just like the diversity of topics in our worship. Like it shouldn't all just be happy and upbeat all the time. Right. We should have songs like It Is Well to be able to express when we're grieving. Because like the story of the guy who wrote It Is Well is an incredibly moving story of his children dying. Mm-hmm. And he wrote that song. Yep. And so like just having... Because the Bible speaks to all these different things, so to have songs that also speak to yeah. all these different things to give people voice, and that's you know that's a downside of getting all your songs from the radio because like positive and encouraging. Like, I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I'm not trying to bash you know what K Love does. <laughs> like I'm, I'd rather there be a K Love than right. not, but um, they're very clear about their mission statement, like that yeah. it is positive, encouraging, uplifting, inspirational. You know, it, that's yeah. what they do, and they say that's what they do, and that's what they do. Mm-hmm. You, so if that's uh, but what's what do most songwriters want? Like, what's their goal to get on K Love? Mm-hmm. So, what kind of music are they going to write? The kind of music that gets played. So, that's why most of our music is like limited to two or three topics, mm-hmm. you know. And, and you can almost kind of follow the formula. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, as worship leaders, you gotta you gotta work hard to find. Like if you're doing a missions conference, you know, mm-hmm. like you know how hard it is to find a, a mission song. Yeah, that's it's hard. hard. Or like a, or like there's some good ones, but it's hard to find them. Yeah, or like just a, a uh, like a confession of sin song. Yeah, like that's a hard. Yeah. Um, and even nowadays, like it's getting, it's even getting hard to find just good, upbeat, theologically sound songs. Mm-hmm. Like one of the hardest slots as a worship leader to fill for me is the first is the opener song yeah because those song tend to be a one. little more weak they're just like happy and yeah like we you, praise you we praise you which is great but it's like but why are we actually praising the lord yeah. there's an extra level of depth with that yeah because a lot of times the faster the song the weaker the theology mm-hmm. um and but that it doesn't have to be the case yeah. but it's often the case so it limits down your ability to pick so um anyway yeah i i, I think that's all good i I love this topic. You have any more thoughts on this? Any around the closing thoughts? No, I think I think just to help people like when you come into worship is just one to remember like again the purpose is to I think to strengthen and unify the body and how are we accomplishing that with our music 
And so learning like the filter for good music, because it's easy to come into a service and be like, oh, well, they didn't sing the song that I like today, so it was bad. Yeah. But thinking more broadly of like, why am I actually here, you know, doing this? Because we can be bad about going through the motions. But when you think of like, not just the vertical vertical aspect of like, I'm worshiping God, but thinking the horizontal aspect of like, this is all of us together singing can really be a really encouraging time. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I So we, we do our best at Kirby Woods, um, just so you to kind of close on our perspective on it. We do our absolute best to follow this. Uh, and we try to do a blend of style. We try to do a blend of uh, hymns and modern mm-hmm. and really, to, and really not even to think like in that category primarily, uh, I, like, I don't, I don't think I go in or Mitch goes into a week and we sit down and we're like, we owe the people some hymns this week because mm-hmm. we did three traditional ones. You know, we did yeah. three contemporary songs. We got to owe them. A, I don't want to think like that. Like that may come through our mind as we're trying to like, you know, get healthy. But ultimately, that's not how I want to think about planning. Yeah. I would like to think, hey, I'm about to preach on this topic today. I'm going in, we're going to do Acts 16, you know, and this topic is going to be covered in this. Mm -hmm. And we can really hammer home the theme that we're trying to cover this day if we do these songs. And whether or not those songs come from whatever decade, I don't care. It Mm -hmm. doesn't matter. It's, It's whether or not it's contributing to an overall worship that we're, that's why we gather together. Mm -hmm. Um, Because to me, like if you can, I've, I've planned so many worship sets the best ones, without fail, the best ones are when there is a clear and present theme yeah. uh, that, that draws from the beginning, uh, and it works through to the sermon, and the closing point merges into the invitation. Yeah. You do that, man, and it's just good planning. It's, mm-hmm. it's just like God plans things. It, when, yeah. you, when you sit down and you think about it and you put, put it out on paper like that, and the songs are... Just and it's even better. Like you can even amp it up. Not only do the song themes roll into one another, but the keys roll into one another, mm-hmm. and the tempo rolls into one another. And and you can seamlessly make it. I mean, this. I'm just telling you, that's how you do it. There's an art to this. Mm-hmm. There is an art to to do this well. Um, and if you have a really good leader, worship leader, who can merge their their prayers and their spoken words and their use of scripture you combine all that that's yeah. a seamless set it is a it is a almost like an offering to god by the time you're done mm-hmm. it's like i've done my best this is on the plate god this is for you mm-hmm. and then the church joins in it's like we're in we're 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 in this um that's how i think about like the best sets possible yeah and it really has nothing to do with like styles and stuff. I, yeah. I want people to understand like it, it really, it lets worship the Lord the best we can yeah. and use, use these wonderful tools and the way God made our minds and our hearts to love music. Mm-hmm. Um, we can use all of that. So yep. we try to do that our best at Kirby Woods. Yes, Surely we're not the best in the world, but we are trying <laughs> to follow this. Um, so uh, I, I think we're doing a good job. I'm, mm-hmm. I think uh, our worship is very good. So I'm happy to to put my stamp of approval on what we do. All right. Any last words? I don't think so. Okay. Well, thanks for being here. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for listening to this episode of Off Scripts on congregational worship music. Um, Hey, go to a church that does this. And uh, if you're looking for one, come to Kirby Woods Baptist Church, 1030 every Sunday, uh, 6325 Poplar Avenue, or see us online kirbywoods.org. Uh, if you have a topic you'd like to submit, uh, go to kirbywoods.org slash off script, and uh, you can anonymously send in your topic there. And uh, hey, I may I may do it in my next episode. You never know. Emily thought this one was never going to see the light of day. And here, here, we, are. We, are. here we are. All right. Thank you guys for listening. Have a great day. Bye.